Hello class, uh, Professor Mandeville back. This is lecture number six for state and local government. Uh, and today, I just want to take, uh, you know, this will be a pretty quick one. I want to talk to you about direct democracy. Now, we covered one form of direct democracy when we covered how uh, in some states state constitutions can be amended uh, through referendum or uh, uh, that are created by citizens themselves who do petition drives, get it on the ballot, bypass the legislature and get the citizens to vote on their proposed amendments. We don't have that ability in New York State, as I mentioned, but that's a form of direct democracy. That's citizens amending the Constitution, not a legislature passing it in both houses and having to do it in two uh, consecutive sessions like in New York State and so forth. Now, there are other forms of direct democracy also that exist in other states but don't exist here in the state of New York. And that's the initiative or proposition. Initiatives and propositions are typically used to pass statutory laws that go onto the books in uh, roughly about 20 states have this ability. New York's not one of them. And it's very similar to the, you know, the grassroots constitutional amendment referendum uh, method. And a group of citizens who wants a law passed, and there could be all sorts of different uh, areas. The most popular right now, this is how most states have legalized the recreational use of marijuana through changing the laws through public initiatives. Or sometimes they're in some states like California, they're called propositions. There have been lots of different areas, uh, though, like uh, there have been uh, state propositions or initiatives to change uh, tax laws, abortion laws, things like that. You name it, they've done it. Now, this is a form of direct democracy, very similar. You, you know, you write up your proposed law, you get go on a petition drive, you have to gather a certain percentage of signatures of people that participated in the previous election. If you do so, then it goes on to the ballot, and then the voters either approve or disapprove of it in the next election. But it's a way of bypassing the legislature. Maybe they refuse to pass the law that you want, so you do it yourselves. That's direct democracy at the state level. And someday, maybe we'll have it in the state of New York. I know that in the past, Governor Cuomo has mentioned in several of his State of the State addresses that he'd like to see the legislature pass a constitutional amendment creating initiatives in the state of New York for us voters. So far, they haven't responded, but things can change. He certainly supports it. So uh, that's another form of direct democracy. And the final form that you may be familiar with, but it's another one that we don't have in New York State, that's the recall election. If a politician does something that's completely unacceptable and refuses to resign, you can start a recall campaign in many states. Uh, there's about uh, 16 states that has this ability, including uh, California is one of them, Wisconsin's another. Uh, what you do, it's very similar. You start a recall petition, you have to gather a certain percentage of signatures, then you submit that petition to the state if you have enough signatures, then a special recall election is held where the voters are asked 
a couple of questions. First, whether or not to recall the politician in question, typically a governor. <clears throat> if they vote yes, if that passes, their second question they're asked is then, who replaces them? And typically there'll be uh, several different candidates all running to replace the potentially recalled governor. Now, uh, one of the most famous ones that happened in the past was when Californians quite some time ago recalled Governor Gray Davis over controversies over electricity pricing and so forth that today we know weren't even his fault. Uh, and he had just been overwhelmingly reelected a year before that, but became pretty unpopular fast. Uh, and they replaced him with the Terminator himself, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who ran as a replacement. Schwarzenegger replaced Gray Davis as governor. And much to the chagrin of many, he was a decent governor. He was then reelected on his own and served another term and did a pretty good job, most critics would agree. <clears throat> and part of it, though, obviously, is he had some pretty good advisors. As many of you may know, at the point when he was governor of the state of California, he was married to Maria Shriver, who is a Kennedy. So I'm sure he had some Kennedys advising him, the political novice, on how to actually be a governor, not just play one in a movie. <clears throat> but one problem that exists, especially in California, there are a lot of books written about it. There's a very low threshold of signatures required to have a recall election. It's something like 15% of the people who voted in the previous election. Studies were done where you could gather that many signatures in two weekends just having people stand outside of malls in California, in Los Angeles under normal circumstances, you know, pre-COVID-19. So, too low, to, low of a threshold. Californians, I'm surprised they haven't had more recalls because they could have one basically at the drop of a hat. And the reason why I think recalls are a bad idea, and I'm glad New York doesn't have them, personally speaking here, and from an academic point of view. One, what most people don't realize, elections are expensive. Traditional elections where people go to the polls and vote are extremely expensive because you have to train First, you have to hire and train all the poll workers. Contrary to common belief up here in the North Country, all the people that work at the polls on Election Day under normal circumstances, who are typically senior citizens up here, are not volunteers. They're paid very well and they're paid to be trained. So, think about how many poll workers you have at each poll and multiply that times the number of polling spots in the state of New York, plus the paper ballots used in those electronic scan machines cost approximately 35 cents a piece. So it's an expensive undertaking. Even if we shifted to an all mail election, printing up the ballots, paying to mail them out, paying to have them mailed back and then processed by machine is going to be more economically, uh, you know, cost less, but it's nonetheless costly. So, in my opinion, I don't want recall elections because voters become fickle and all of a sudden hate the governor or attorney general or comptroller or whatever statewide elected official. And besides, we already have a process to deal with that sort of thing. If the person is doing something illegal, they can be impeached in the state of New York, just like they can at the federal level. 
the Assembly and the Senate can throw these statewide elected officials out of office by having an impeachment proceeding. And many of you probably remember this, but the system really works. And we don't even have to go through impeachment. Many of you may remember former Governor Elliot Spitzer. He was, you know, was governor for, I don't know, two and a half years or so. And uh, he was involved in a prostitution trafficking ring, uh, which was his downfall. He was discovered by federal officials when he was transferring sums of money larger than $10,000 across state borders to hire escorts which obviously that was a federal crime and also completely socially unacceptable. And it took him about two days after it was all uncovered and the feds were going to press charges that he resigned from office. We didn't have to go through any impeachment proceedings. He knew he blew it and he did the gentlemanly thing and resigned from office and turned the government over to his lieutenant governor, Governor David Patterson who was, you know, as honest as they come. So, we didn't even have to go through impeachment. He knew he was done and he was gone. New York functions pretty well in that uh, area. So, one other thing I would mention about uh, direct democracy, which will kind of tie us into what we're going to be talking about in the future when we talk about political participation in the next module Direct democracy increases political participation, especially in states that have initiatives on the ballot. And there's been studies done that indicate that having an initiative on the ballot in the approximately 20 states that have this ability increases voter turnout by anywhere from 3 to 5% which is significant. And the way they know this is, every so often there'll be an election where there won't be any initiatives or propositions on the ballot because nobody just came up with one or whatever. In those elections, they see the turnout decrease by 3 to 5% because a lot of people are more interested in voting on potential laws and things like that than they are the politicians themselves. So in my mind, anything that simply increases voter turnout by 3 to 5% is a reform you need to adopt immediately. That's why we need initiatives on the ballot. Uh, to me, that makes them worth it, no matter, you know, I'm, there's criticisms against them and so forth, but they're all null and void if you can increase voter turnout by 3 to 5%, in my mind. So... Uh, the other thing there's, uh, you know, chapter four in your textbook is devoted to finances. So obviously there's a lot of talk about taxes. In fact, there's some talk about a proposition in California, proposition 13 that reformed tax property taxes in the state of California forever. And that happened back in the late seventies and led the tax reform movement that's still moving today and is what was ultimately responsible for the uh, 2% tax cap, property tax cap in the state of New York. I'm not going to talk to you much about finances and taxes and things like that. The authors do a fine job explaining it to you in there, and it's not one of my areas of expertise, uh, and I'm not an economist either. So, Read what your authors have to tell you, and you're going to take a you know a chapter quiz on it. I'm not going to devote a, a you know a video lecture to it. Next time I talk to you will be in the next module, and I'll be talking about political participation, one of my areas of expertise and one of my favorite subjects. So get in there into the discussion. Start talking about chapters two, three, and four, or I mean three and four, I believe it is. Uh, you know, it differs from fall to summer. Get to work. The discussions are a big part of your grade. 
uh, and I'll be talking to you in the near future. Everyone be safe. Take care.